guys, this is Pastor Jim. And this is Seth. Welcome, Welcome to, to Primary Camp Meeting. Dear Jesus, Please create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Now Grace is going to teach us how routine helps us keep our bodies and rooms clean. It is important to have routine so you know what you will do next. So you, like for example, if I was playing with my toys and I thought, well, what do I do next? And your mom, mom or dad or parents have to remind you for that. So it's important to have routines. If you don't know your routine yet, put right on a piece of paper. I draw pictures if you don't know how to write yet. Today, um, I'm going to make my bed and so, um, so I can sleep at night and it's very comfortable. It's important to do it so your mom doesn't have to do it. It's very tough for her. If you're a mom, you, you will feel like it when you grow up. So I will. First, I'm doing my pillow. And there you have it, that's how I make, make my bed. <laughs> this is how I pick up my toys. My routine is when I'm done with my toys, it's important for me to pick them up. I don't just put stuff them where, where like in the corner of the closet. I just put them where they go because, um, because it's um, then I will find it there and and it won't fall on me or something. I look the the right things to put in the certain boxes. It is important to pick up your toys or someone might step on them. It might hurt them. Now I just have a few more dolls to pick up. Now I'm shutting my drawer. If something doesn't fit right, I just move things around. And there you have it. That's how I pick up my toys. Now, ne next I'm going to show you how to um, wash my hair. <laughs> What's your best funny face? Oh, that's silly. First, I get my hair wet and my body wet too. 
Why? Because it has protein to keep your hair nice and clean, so you, when you comb it, it won't be so snarly. Plus, it is easier to comb, too. I got my hair wet, and now I'm going to do sh shampoo because it will make it easier to comb and soft. It's, it's important because it, it is easier to comb too and to do some hairdos. Ah! When? Right now? Oh, now I have some um, shampoo on, on my hands. Now I'm going to scrub it on my head. It's important to make bubbles so it is nice and fluffy and, and it makes it so soft and it, it cleans it too. All the dirt and dust you have in your hair. Put your nails like this and then put your then go, go like this to your skull. It's okay if you do this, it won't, if you think it might stroll your hair, it does, but it's, but it's great to do it. I have my hair some suds and now I will do it some more. One patch of shampoo and then you scrub it and then and then you um, wash some out and then you do another and do it and make this many sides. It's important to keep it all over your eyes then it, then it will make your eyes red and it will sting. <laughs> I like to wash my hair because I want to catch Tara. Tara's my friend to their church. And what about Tara do you want to catch? I want to catch as long as her hair and we're trying to see who can get the longest hair. Of course it's her so far. And how long is her hair? Well, hair is about like right here. Right even longer. I will rinse it this out. Okay, are you ready to rinse? Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Now I have con conditioner on my hands and I will scrub it very good. <clears throat> it's important to do it because um because it will make it comb through easy. Smell the banana. <laughs> <laughs> I will wash my body now because it will make it nice and clean and the dirt fall off. And that's how you wash your hair in your body. Um, I'm going to brush my teeth because it is important to brush your teeth because um, you might get ca cavities if you don't. First, I, I am going to, um, I water my toothbrush. Now I'm going to put my toothpaste on. Toothpaste on my brush. The toothpaste is the most important part because it will clean your teeth. And now I will brush my teeth. Brush your teeth at least for one minute or two. It is important to not, um, do not swell toothpaste. And now I will wash my brush. So, that job's done. And now get some water with a cup and put it in the 
and now put in your mouth. And then spit it out. And then dump the rest out. Put it away. And wash the sink it has if it has some toothpaste. And that's how you brush your teeth. I'm, now I'm going to comb my hair. If you don't know how to comb your hair, just let, just let a adult do it for you and comb it nice and smooth. Don't just yank it. It will make it. It will make you say ouch. And it is important to ju just do a little section. Sections don't just go just one little and then another and another. Have the smells all gone. Do you like to get your hair brushed? Sometimes. Not if it's so ouchy. <laughs> so Sophie! Sophie! I will sh show you my babysitter's dog. Come here. She is a mastiff. Yeah, she's only four months old. Her name is Sophie. Um. <laughs> she likes to bark. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> You'll probably hear that for once in a while. Grace just taught us how we could keep our bodies and where we live clean. That's also talked about in the Bible. The Bible teaches us how to keep our hearts and our minds also clean. Isaiah 1, 16 through 17. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, says God. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. In Psalms 51, 7, it says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Talking about our sins. <laughs> hey guys, let's go see Marilee's museum. Now, I don't know why, but I've always been fascinated by shells, even since I was a little girl. But I've never had the opportunity to be by an ocean or any place there was water. Do you know that shells are found everywhere in the world? Do you know you can collect shells right outdoors behind your house? Probably if you look under some dead leaves and things, you might find a shell. It's called a snail, but it would have a shell on it. And then there's some shells called slugs that don't even have shells, but they still are considered a, a shell or a slug. And then if you venture into the pond, oh my, there's all kinds of different species of shells in the pond and in the river. Clams, bivalves, you know, that, that they're found in the highest mountains you can find shells and in the deepest part of the sea. But of course, the prettiest shells and the most colorful ones are found in the ocean. That's because the water is warm most of the time, and there's all the nutrients that help them to grow and be so beautiful. Well, anyway, you need to know a little bit about when you start looking about what you're looking for. So, let's say you have the opportunity to go to the beach. I hope some of you have been to the beach. Now, I didn't get to go to the beach till I was an adult. Can you believe that? So, the best thing to do, if you've never had any experience, is just to go walk along the beach. Go walk along the beach. But now you could notice that the tide is out, and that's a whole nother study about the tides 
and about how God made tides to change and how the tides help the ocean and help all the living things that are in the ocean. But if you go to the beach when the tide is out, more of the beach is exposed and you can walk further out into the sea and look around, look under rocks, look around things. Shells really don't like pretty sandy, wavy beaches. They like kind of quiet, mucky places to live. That's where I'd want to live too if I was a shell. So you go and you look around and then you can see things. And the more you look, the more you see. And you always are discovering something new. So through the years, I've been able to go and travel and go to different beaches. And then you get tired of kind of walking on the beach. Pretty soon you think, hmm, if I could just get a little deeper, I could find something even a little better. So maybe you put on a mask and fins, but you better have some swimming lessons first. Either that or wear a life jacket, because you remember, safety first. So put on your mask, you know how mud a mask is, put on your fins, and then you can paddle around and look and see all the beautiful things that God has made. Well, sometimes you look around and you can scoop, skin dive, you know how you take and you do a pike dive and you go down and you look around and you tick, tick for rocks and you look and you look and pretty soon you think, man, I sure wish I could get just a little deeper or stay down just a little longer. So then comes the next phase. Well, that's called scuba diving. You know what scuba stands for? It's S-C-U-B-A. Stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Now, that's something then that you put on your back. You carry your air with you, and you breathe in a regulator that gives you the right pressure, but you're carrying your air on your back. So with that, it gets a little more complicated. So you have to go to school again and learn how to take lessons, because if you don't do it properly, you could really end up dying, actually. So it's serious. So you learn to look, be a scuba diver. And so that's when the whole world opens up to you. And then you can even find more shells. You can see fish, you can see corals, you can see all the beautiful things that God created for you.
I want to tell you a little bit about this shell. We call this God's submarine. Now, actually, this is a mollusk, but it's in a class all by itself because it's really special. This is one of the most intelligent shells in the ocean. This animal that lives in this shell is related to a squid and an octopus. Squid and octopus are actually mollusks, too, because they have a little shell. When you open up this shell, you will see little tiny chambers. And the animal lives in these chambers, and he, as he grows, his shell grows, and he has a little siphon tube right here that connects these chambers. And so he is able to raise and lower himself in the ocean. Now, when you go diving in the pool, and you do a pipe dive and you go down so far, you have to have air to breathe and you come up and your lungs expand. That's something else you learn when you, when you dive. You've got air in your lungs and if you leave that air in your lungs and you come to the top, the air expands and that will kill you if you don't breathe. So this animal, how does he go up and down from the very depths of the ocean, maybe two or 300 feet deep, and go to the surface and not explode? A fish would explode if you bring him up too fast. Have you ever gone fishing and you move a fish up too fast? It explodes. So God has designed each one of these little chambers to be connected by this tube. And this animal moves this this air, this oxygen, in and out of these chambers so he can go up and down and float around. It's truly a miracle of creation. There's a reason why they named one of the first submarines the Nautilus, because man figured that out from the shell that God created on the fifth day of creation. Amazing. Isn't it just amazing? I want to show you. We talked a little bit about scuba diving and about wearing the tank on your back. But there is a limit to depths that you can go. There's a limit to how long you can stay down. And there's definitely a danger in, in some of these areas. So now, to even get deeper into the ocean, I've had the privilege of traveling with the Smithsonian Institution looking for shells. Would you believe that there's so many things yet to be discovered about God's creation, even so far down in the sea that deeper than we can ever imagine. So the only way you get down that deep is to get in a little submarine. So you'll have some pictures I'll show you of the submarine that we crawled into. tell you a little bit about the shells that we were collecting and what scientists were trying to learn about shells. Because people are able to get down in these depths now and have a submarine with these little arms that go out that they're all controlled within the sub, you can collect little shells that are deep down in the water. They bring them up and then they study them to check the DNA to make sure that they are where they, what they think they are. So we went on a little expedition. In fact, I've been on several little expeditions. So one of the shells that we were looking for are commonly referred to as slit shells or protonaria. And so we were going at very deep depths and we were finding these shells. And there's a picture of one that, that's actually from the submarine that was taken of this shell on the wall. So we would travel deep into deep into the ocean and collect these shells and put them in a little basket and bring them up. Also, there was some research done with the bioluminescence lights, kind of similar to what we see outside when we see the fireflies. Well, these lights are going on all the time in the sea. Did you know that God created all kinds of fish and things in the ocean that have bioluminescence? And scientists are still trying to discover why do they have these? Why are they different colors? What are they? Are they attracting a mate? Are they signs of danger? Are they signs of trying to catch, capture prey? All these things going on. And these, these creatures move up and down in the ocean and look like tubes of light. So at nighttime, they go more to the surface to feed. And then at night, they return in the morning to return to the depths of the sea. 
So there's all this science and all this research that's being done today about the bioluminescence and about shells and about squid and about all kinds of things that live in the depths of the sea. So we were collecting these shells, and this is the Pleurotomeria, the shells that we were after. There's not very many different species or different kinds of Pleurotomeria because they're such a rare shell because they occur in very, very deep water. This is the only way you're going to find a live Pleurotomeria is to get into a submarine. So this is what we were collecting, these two species of Pleurotomeria in the submarine. This is one of the shells that we discovered in some of the rubble that was brought up in the submarine, taken back to the laboratories at the Smithsonian, and I had the privilege of naming it. Which one is your shell? This one, number 15. Number 15. Then, also, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the National Geographic videos about Alvin that goes down in the very, very deep parts of the sea, and there are these vents in the sea where there's water and heat and everything spewing out from the middle of the ocean. And in those vents are two worms. Now, two worm is a type of a shell or a mollusk. And I have a couple of pieces of them here. And they grow. Here again, they have there's a, an intake and an outlet, kind of similar to the, sh the um, Worm, two worms that you find today in Florida, except that, of course the ones in Florida are little tiny ones, different species and different ways they, that they form. These are pretty much straight, and the animal that lives in here is very bright red because of probably the lack of oxygen there. And then they live, they're filter feeders, and they live in the very, very depths of the ocean. So here's an example of a very large, large, and this unfortunately broke, but this was another piece of a very, very large two worms that come out of the deep, deep parts of the ocean. So you can see that all of God's creation is found everywhere you look, from the highest of heavens to the deepest of the sea. And then there's one scuba picture there that was on a night dive. It's a basket star that is absolutely phenomenal. You can see all the beautiful things that God created for you when you learn how to scuba dive. But even if you never learn how to scuba dive, at least go walk on a beach, go look in the pond, go check the Zumbro River or wherever, and look for shells. <laughs> look at this spider. <laughs> look at that spider. Scientist the name it is Nephila Madagascarensis. It can give the golden wipes. The golden the wipes. Golden webs, yes, oh, golden yeah. wipes. For us Madagascar people, we use it for uh, making the traditional clothes. Oh, yes, well, you do use it. They come in of the European people. For clothes, you say? Clothes, yes. It made from uh, golden wipes. And uh, the people from your country who live here in Madagascar, people from US, they explore the golden wipes for making the bulletproof. They use it for that, really? Yes, yes. Like Kevlar? Like more than Kevlar, strong more than Kevlar. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The male it's more. That is, you that's cannot very it strong. Anymore because yeah. it's strong. That's 700 strong. meters for one spider. Wow. So then you make bulletproof or bullet resistant clothes with that stuff. It is yeah, very yeah. strong. It feels like filament. Lemurs are a kind of monkey. Lemurs live in the rainforest areas of Madagascar. There is a preserve for lemurs at Andasi Bay, which is halfway between the East Side Ocean and the capital city of Antananarivo. Many lemurs are on the endangered species list because some foreigners came through to build a road and they ate a bunch of lemurs. They're endangered for other reasons too. Lemurs, they eat leaves and flowers and all kinds of vegetation. Here you see us feeding them bananas. <laughs> Maybe the most popular lemur in America is the ring-tailed lemur, but there are lots of kinds. There are injury lemurs also, like the black and white one right here that's called the ruffled lemur. There's also the diadem, 
Sefaka lemurs. The black and white ruffled lemur and the diadem Sefaka are part of the leaping lemur family. They jump from tree to tree. There are all sorts of animals in Madagascar. Look at this funny crab that was on the beach in St. Marie Island. These fish were caught by some natives and put in this basket. This is a basket on a bicycle. And they peddled it around the neighborhood asking who would like fish for breakfast. Fish for breakfast, fish for breakfast, fresh fish for breakfast. Or look at the cattle. Cattle work when they're in Madagascar. See how he's pulling the ox cart? Here are some cute goats. And look at that boy. His job is to help the family by being with the goats during the day as they're out getting grass. There are several interesting kind of geckos in Madagascar. The day gecko is green with red dots on its back. It lives in the northern part of the island. It likes to eat insects and nectar. There's also a leaf-tailed gecko, which we don't have a picture of, but it has a funny-looking tail. There are other geckos here. I don't know exactly what kind. You might need to research and see if you can figure out what kind of geckos these are. Can you see an animal in this photo? It's the panther chameleon. It changes colors. Madagascar is the center of diversity for chameleons. Madagascar has 56 of the world's 130 species of chameleons. Have you ever heard of a skinx? Well, that's what this creature is, I think. You might need to look him up too. Oh, look at this. This boy has a tortoise. The radiated tortoise has a highly domed carapace up to 40 centimeters long. That's almost 16 inches. And it weighs up to 14 kilograms. That's 30 pounds. The carapace is black with yellow to cream colored stripes of varying width and they radiate outward from a pale center. They're abundant in the south of Madagascar but can be found all over the island. The Nile Crocodile lives in Madagascar. It is king in Madagascar because it is the only fearsome predator that lives on the island. In fact, the Nile Crocodile is thought to be the most dangerous crocodilian to humans in the world. It makes the most attacks on humans. They can weigh up to 2,100 pounds even though they hatch from a little two-inch egg. And they can grow, grow, grow to be 16 to 20 feet long. The Nile crocodile cannot control his body temperature. If you see him laying with his mouth open, he's probably trying to cool off. And if you see him soaking up the morning sun, he's trying to warm up. The Nile crocodile is a freshwater reptile, but it has been known to swim 400 miles across the salt water of the Mozambique Canal. It can also walk 15 miles across dry land to find water because it needs water. It can stay underwater for very long periods of time. The Nile crocodile is the most dangerous on Madagascar Island. He's the king. There's lots of different birds in Madagascar yellow birds and red birds and blue birds and chickens. I don't know what all these different kinds of birds are. 
You might have fun trying to find them. Look at this nest. Wow, some bird went to a lot of trouble to make a very interesting nest. And look at this one. Well, that one wasn't made by a bird. I think that one was made by insects. Maybe some kind of wasps. Oh, here's another spider. And here's another creepy crawly picture. Some kind of caterpillars there. They look like they're just coming out of the nest. Can you believe this? It's a dragonfly. Look how God made those paper thin wings. You can see right through them. Aren't they beautiful? Just gorgeous. There are so many different little creatures in Madagascar. But the crocodile is the only one that could hurt a human. There is one other predator, and it's called a fusa. It's kind of like wild cats we have here, like a mountain lion, but it's not nearly as big. They live only in forested areas. 50% of their diet is lemurs. While I was in Madagascar, I traveled several days with Pastor Herifidi. We traveled in the city of Antananarivo. The farther up you go on the mountain in Antananarivo, the wealthier, more comfortable you'll be, and the farther you go down towards the bottom and towards the water, the tended to be more poor and difficult to, to make a living. So some people live in brick houses and some people live in, in mud houses with grass roofs. And other people lived out of shacks that build out of whatever they could find. And some people, they just barely live. They just barely get by. And so we traveled down the mountain, down the mountain, down the mountain, all the way to just feet away from the water. We went down steps, we went down streets, we went down everything to get to the very bottom. And we found there, at the bottom of the mountain, we found a group of Seventh-day Adventists who had been meeting under a tree for church for 40 years. 40 years they'd meet under a tree outside to go to church. Sometimes it would rain. Sometimes it would be nice out, sometimes it would be hot out, but that was where they met to celebrate Jesus on the Sabbath day. And they had been praying they could have a place a little more um, permanent, a lot more permanent. Now I'm going to tell you about another little lady who's a grandma now with white hair, but at the time she started praying she was very young. And she prayed that she was the only believer in her community and she told her neighbors you know I'm going to build a church I'm going to build a church there in my field one day but her neighbors knew how poor she was and they knew that uh, there was no one to help her to build that church in her field and that's where she planted crops and things like that anyhow and that's how she made a living and years and years and they teased her and they laughed at her and they, they made fun of her and they certainly did not believe that God would answer her prayer. But she kept on praying. This is near the town of Montesu. Actually, it's probably 30 miles from Montesu. It's not near much of anything. And one day, a retired teacher and her retired pastoral husband decided to become missionaries. They said they'd be a missionary to a dark place, meaning a place that didn't have a Seventh-day Adventist church or a Seventh-day Adventist school or, or, or anything like that. And so they went far out into the countryside and they showed up in this small community where they weren't very welcome at the beginning. And no one was really interested in churches um, and no one was interested in anything new per se. But the retired teacher, she decided she would sit there by her, by the street and she would begin to teach kids how to read or at least some letters and, and beginnings of reading. And the parents really caught on to that and they really thought that was interesting and a really good idea. And 
day after day, the crowd of kids were started out with just one or two. The next day, several more came. <clears throat> and the following day, and, and more and more kept coming. They said, maybe we should start a school. And so the missionaries, they did. They planted a Seventh-day Adventist school where all the families and community send their children there. There's more than 100 students and eight teachers working there in a leased building. The building was leased and the lease was coming up, which means they rented the building and they would soon have no place else to have a school. And so they were praying about how to deal with that. Should they try to renew the lease, which would lock them in for many more years and many more dollars, or should they uh, maybe Lord provide something else? In the meanwhile, Lord was providing something else. Here in Minnesota, God was answering their prayers and we were putting schools and churches into a large container the size of a large garage and we ship it to the coast, east coast of the United States by a truck, by a semi-truck. Right. Through the different states all over the country on the sleeper cap so the these children from the Maranatha Seventh-day Adventist School are touring the factory where one-day churches are made in Minnesota in the United States. The same factory also makes cement mixers. One-day churches have been built all over the world. Here are a few pieces of metal getting ready for another one-day church shipment. And they load it on to a great big cargo ship which floats across the Atlantic Ocean down past the Horn of Africa and around the South Africa and back to the island of Madagascar where they unload it and our people there retrieve it on another pickup truck and they start going from place to place building buildings so that people's prayers can be answered. So what happened to the church that prayed for 40 years while they met under a tree? They did receive a building and they have finished that building and it's a beautiful building where they can meet. And you know what, kids? The place is full of believers, it's full of children, it's full of young families 
and they are celebrating Jesus on the Sabbath day. What happened to the grandmother who prayed and prayed and people picked on her and teased her, what happened to her? Well, one day she started pulling up crops and leveling the ground and the neighbors really thought she was losing her mind and laughing hysterically. They told her that if God built a church there, they would attend because we know it would be a miracle. And one day, a truck rolled into town and started unloading and building a church right where uh, she promised there would be a church one day. And then uh, the church did ask us that if we uh, can uh, get the bricks necessary for the home. And now the neighbors are filling up that church and they're worshiping Jesus on the Sabbath day and praying and they certainly believe in miracles there. And what happened to the school? Well, there's a number of things that have happened in the school. Nearby, we built a, a training center for young people and Adventist youth could come and meet and be trained for uh, doing Bible work and call porter work of selling them books and showing books and um, preparing for leadership in their communities. But at the school itself, it, we have provided two new buildings that they will finish and fill up with those hundred plus kids now. It seems like there's more kids every year um, teaching Adventist and Bible teachings and bringing smiles to the families of the community. Communities love uh, Seventh-day Adventists in Madagascar and they all come together uh, over a new construction project like this. This is used as a church and the school. All these young people come out to greet us. The church itself, the wall was built by the, the youth of the church. God answers the prayers of a grandmother. God answers the prayers of a congregation meeting under trees. God answers prayers of school teachers and students and families. And God can answer your prayers as well. Hey, it's time for Peg Doll's Bible Biography with Pastor Ken. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken. I'm going to be telling you some stories about Elijah. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And the first story is from 1 Kings chapter 17. <laughs> Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, Elijah said to Ahab, as Yahweh the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. The word of Yahweh came to him saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Carrot, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of Yahweh. For he went and lived by the brook Carrot, which is east of the Jordan.
The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning. And bread and meat in the evening. And he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And then the word of Yahweh came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please, get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please, bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As Yahweh your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me, and afterward you may make one for yourself and one for your son. For thus says Yahweh God of Israel, the bowl flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that Yahweh sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty according to the word of Yahweh, which he spoke through Elijah. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And so she said to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, give me your son. And then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. And he called to Yahweh and he said, Oh, Yahweh, my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? And then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to Yahweh and said, Oh, Yahweh, my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. And Yahweh heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of Yahweh in your mouth is truth. And you know what? We can know that God's going to take care of us if we get into trouble like Elijah did too. He's going to make sure that we have our food and water and he's going to take care of us. And just like that widow and her son had enough bread and oil, he'll make sure we have what we need as well if we put our faith and trust in him. Okay guys, I guess it's time for the recap. 
what kids can do. Gray showed us that we could keep our rooms, our bodies, and our hearts clean. Did you see the underwater footage that Mary Lee showed us? Huh, I wonder what other things I could go out and find in nature. In the Madagascar project, a woman prayed for 40 years before getting a church and a school. That's a long time to pray. Sometimes we get discouraged just praying for a day. But you know what? God hears all of our prayers and sometimes he just tells us to wait. You know, I had a dog. Every time he was outside, birds would bring him bread. Every day. That's the same thing that happened in our story. Elijah was brought bread by ravens. And then, oh, what was that place's name? The woman of Zarephath? Yeah, however you say that fancy word, God takes care of his people. Well guys, that's all for this time. I'll see you next time.